Right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen, nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, wa ba'd. Uh, Inshallah, just so, like the people that are following along, it's recommended, and this is in seeking knowledge in general, that you uh, get the book that you're going through, and you should like read before, and then take notes if you can, and then read the same chapter like afterwards, so it's more likely to stick in your mind, inshallah. So the book we're going to again is Da' with Dawa, The Sickness and the Cure, by Ibn Qayyim, and it's translated uh, online as well, so you can find the um, translated version if you need as well, for free. Um, so now we're going on to the uh, section of Al-Qadr with Dua, the Divine Decree and Dua. And um, I thought it'd be fitting as well, like last week we went over the, some of the Qawaid or the principles of Asma Illahi wa Sifatihi. So today before we get into the, the chapter of Qadr, I thought it's you know important to go through some of the uh, principles as well of what Qadr means and uh, the basically the principles and rules of Qadr that we have to have as belief as a Muslim. And we all know that the Qadr is the sixth pillar of Iman, right? Right, everybody? <laughs> I hope, alhamdulillah. <laughs> what are the six pillars real quick? al iman Billahi. Inshallah, that's a belief in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, the the final day, and all that was related to it in terms of Jannah and Nar, and then the final one is the belief in Qadr. So Qadr, uh, the divine decree. Um, the Imam is talking about Dua and Qadr. He's continuing for where we left off, but more in more detail. And um, it's also since we're talking about the sickness and the cure, the the belief in Qadr, the having Iman and Qadr. Is one of the great greatest of cures for any type of depression or anxiety, you know. So I don't know if he did that in, intentionally, but it's one of the things you can drive. Like he's putting it at this juncture. So he went first, you know, saying that the uh, cure for um, ignorance was the question or seeking knowledge, and then he mentioned the cure of the Quran for all the types of physical and uh, spiritual diseases. And then he went into the du'a in detail how the dua is a cure for everything and now he's going to like a subsection talking about the qadr and dua how they work together right because many um, or some groups have gone astray in this 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 uh, subject of the divine decree so he's mentioning it here in the in the chapter of dua but I was saying also it could be um, one of the cures as well because when you have firm faith in in the divine decree of Allah Azza wa Jal, and you know that he's in control of everything and nothing happens except by his permission and he's the most wise and he knows what's best for us. When something happens to you, you know, a normal person that doesn't have this iman, he might get depressed. Or if something in the future is unclear, he might be anxious or nervous and not know what's going to happen. But as a mu'min who has true faith in qadr, qada and qadr, he's like at peace in his heart. You know, so it cures any types of uh, depression and anxiety when you have a strong belief in qadr. So Allah alam if that was one of the reasons he put it in this chapter as well. Uh, the qadr in Arabic means... Uh, well, we have two words refer to this. Some scholars say it's the same thing, qada and qadr. Uh, qada literally can mean like the ruling or perfecting something or completing something, right? And qadr means to take into account or evaluate or plan, right? So some scholars linguistically, you can divide those two into those, those type of uh, different meanings, completion and planning. Uh, a lot of scholars say that they are the one and the same when they're mentioned separately. They include each other. In Islamic terminology, the Qadr is uh, the decree of all uh, things that Allah has written subhanahu wa ta'ala from the beginning of time until the end. And uh, in it, there's uh, four major pillars to it that we are going to go over inshallah. One scholar, he distinguished between uh, Qadr or Qadha and Qadr by saying that like the program that Allah made before he created the universe, you know, pre-eternity as you say, is called Qadr. And the application of that program is called Qadha. So some scholars distinguish between Qadr and Qadha. But like I said, the majority of scholars, they say it's the same thing. It's basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's defined decree. And it has four major components to it to have your Iman and Qadr complete. Does anybody know what those four components are? For Qadr? No. 
So it's like, I'll give you a hint. The first one is knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of everything that ever was, is, or will be, or wasn't how it would have been, right? Anybody? Number two? Okay, so this is the pillar of our iman, inshallah. So I advise myself and all of us to go back and study because this is very important. Like if it's a pillar of your iman and you don't know the basic requirements of it, then we should you know, be a little bit worried and go back and try to figure it out, inshallah. So inshallah we'll figure it out together here. So the four pillars of Qadr are Al-Ilm, Al-Kitaba, al mashia and Al-Khalq. So knowledge, the writing, the, the will of Allah Azza wa Jal, and the creation. And we'll go through each one, inshallah, in detail. So Al-Ilm, knowledge, like I said, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows, you know, يَعْلَمُ مَا كَانَ وَمَا كَائِنْ وَمَا سَيَكُنْ وَمَا لَمْ يَكُنْ لَوْ كَانَ كَيْفِ يَكُنْ Allah, He knows what was and what is and what will be and what wasn't if it was how it would be. His knowledge is perfect and there's no comparison to Him in knowledge. The second part, Kitaba, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He writes everything that will be. And this is written in Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz before the creation of the, uh, all the creation before, uh, before uh, 50,000 years. The third one, al mashia basically nothing happens except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Right? And the fourth, Al-Khalq, the creation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created everything and the actions of everything. So this is the major pillars of Qadr. The first, we go into a little bit more detail, Al-Ilm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْنُوا مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ فِي كِتَابِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows everything in the heavens and the earth? Verily, this is in the book, and verily, this is easy for Allah. So Allah, the, the, the shahid of the ayah is Al-Ilm. Allah ya'na ma fi samawati wal He knows everything in the heavens and the earth. In another ayah, وَعَنْدُهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْنَمُهَا إِلَّاهُ وَيَعْنَمُ مَا فِي الْبِرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقَطُ مِنْ وَلَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْنَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطَبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ In Surah Al-An'am, Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, With Him are the treasures of the, uh, treasures of the unseen. No one knows them except Him, Allah Azza wa Jalla. He knows whatever there is in the sea and in the land. No leaf falls without His knowing, nor is there a grain in the darkness of the earth nor anything fresh or withered, except that is in a clear book. So every single leaf, if you ever look at a tree and see how many leaves are on one tree and try to count it, right? It's almost impossible, just one tree for one person trying to count it. So imagine every single tree in every single country on the earth. Any, tr- any, any leaf that falls, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows it. Every grain of sand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. Every thought that's in your hand, Allah azza wa jal, He knows it. That's al-ilm. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His knowledge is, is complete in the sense that He knows every single detail perfectly, right? Like we might know something and understand something, but our knowledge is not complete, our knowledge is not perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows because there's no time limit for Him. He sees everything, you know? Like we have a yesterday and today and tomorrow, and we, see, can, we can only see that which is present. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sees everything. You know, there is no time limits, time limits upon him. So past, future, and present, all are, are manifest to Allah Azza wa Jal. His knowledge is complete. هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله. There is uh, Allah. He is Allah, the one that there is no one where they worship except uh, Him, and He knows the unseen. And the apparent, and he is the all merciful, the all gracious. وَعَسَى أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَى أَن تُحِبُّوا شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْنَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْنَمُونَ Maybe that you will um, dislike something and it is better for you, or you may like something and it is bad for you. Allah knows وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْنَمُونَ And you do not know. And there's many, many more ayah, but just so you have a gist of it, those are the main ayats that show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows everything, and He knows what's best for us. And even if something apparently to us is, is bad, sometimes it could be good for us. Allah, He knows. Everything that Allah does is good. In the hadith, the Prophet he said about the children of the mushrikeen, 
Allah Ta'ala إِذَا خَلَقُهُمْ أَعْنَمَ بِمَا كَانُوا عَامِلِينَ That, so someone asked what happens to the children of the, you know, the polytheist, for example, in the next life. He said Allah is the one who created them, so He knows what they would have done, or He knows what they will do. And then there's a story of the Khidr also, how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knew that that boy was going to be, become evil, right? In Surah Al-Kahf. So this is Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's knowledge of uh, preceding the khalq, preceding the, the creation. He knows everything that's going to happen. And there's many other narrations, for example, the one that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا لَهُ مَنْزِلَانِ مَنْزِلٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْزِلٌ فِي النَّارِ فَإِذَا مَاتَ فَدَخَلَ النَّارِ وَرِثَ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ مَنْزِلُهُ فَذَلِكَ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَلَيَكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ So every single person that's born has two stations, like a station in the, hellfire, in the paradise and a station in the hellfire. And if you die and you enter in paradise, someone else will, will inherit your station in the hellfire. And if, you, if somebody out of the dies and goes into the hellfire, the Muslim or the Mu'min, the believer, will inherit their place in the paradise. And Allah knows exactly who every single manzil that, was, that will be uh, in existence. You know. So everything from the beginning until the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows. The second point is the kitabah, the writing. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He wrote everything that will be before the creation by 50,000 years. And this is the Loh al Mahfuz. You know the hadith the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there was nothing, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had the, uh, upon the throne, and he told the pen to write, and the pen asked, What should I write? And he said, Everything that will be. So this is the kitabah, and it's written, Everything that will happen, small and large. As Allah Azza said, وَكُلُّ صَغِيرٌ وَكَبِيرٌ مُسْتَطَرٌ Every uh, small thing and every big thing is written. Surah Al Qamar. فَمَا بَالَ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى قَالَ عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّ فِي كِتَابِ لَا يُضِلُّ رَبِّي وَلَا يَنْسَى In Surah Taha, <coughs> what is the news of the previous generations? They say, the knowledge is with my Lord in the book. In Kitab. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ عَلَى ابْنِ آدَمْ حَظَّهُ مِنَ الزِّنَى أَدْرَكَ ذَلِكَ لَا مَحَالَ فَزِنَى الْعَيْنِ النَّظَرِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written upon the child of Adam his share of zina, fornification. And the zina of the eye is looking, and the zina of the tongue is the speaking, and the zina, uh, and the nafs, the soul, either um, desires that, and, it, and you either basically confirm it or you negate it. So you have those temptations through all those senses, and you have the will to confirm it or negate it in terms of fornication. But the point of the shahid from this uh, hadith is the uh, katab Allah. Allah has written. Uh, the kitabah, there's like five main times for writing. And we said the first one was what? Lawh al mahfuz That's the kitabat al-azari. You know, before the creation, by 50,000 years, Allah Azza wa Jalla, He wrote down everything that will be. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ مَقَادِيرِ الْخَلَائِقِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَخْلَقَ, س- أن يخلق السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَلْضَ بِخَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً That Allah has written the decree of the creation before He created the heavens and the earth by 50,000 years. The second kitabah is Al-Mithaq. This is the time that Allah Azza wa Jal, he, 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 he wrote uh, for the person when He took the contract between us, the children of Adam, and uh, <coughs> Allah Azza wa Jal. So you know in the Surah Al-A'raf when Allah asked everybody if they would believe in Him alone and not commit uh, shirk and everybody agreed. So that's the hujjah, that's the fitrah upon every human being. They already bear witness that there's only one God and they should not commit shirk. <coughs> so when you're born you have that originally in your heart. However you can change as time goes on by the environment that you're living in or you can forget or you can leave it. But that's the mithaq that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa wrote afterwards, after the, uh, one, the initial creation, before we, we were born. The third uh, kitabah is the kitabat of Al-Umar, or Al-Umari, the, the lifetime kitabah. And this is what uh, the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, he said, the Prophet said, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ يَجْمَعَ خَلْقُهُ فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ يَوْمًا نُطْفَةً ثُمْ يَكُونُ عَلَقَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ ثُمْ يَكُونُ مُضْغَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ ثُمْ يُرْسِلُ الْمَلِكَ فِيُنْفِقُ فِيهِ الرُّوحِ وَيَأْمُرُ بِأَرْبَعَ كَلِمَاتٍ 
بكتب رزقه وجره وشقي أو سعيد. So when a person is in the womb, a, a baby is born. This is another writing, the third writing. The angel comes and writes if it will be um, the length of its of its uh, life, and if it will be from the believers or the disbelievers, and if it will be happy or if it will be sad. The fourth one is the taqdir al-sanawi, the yearly writing. And that happens during Laylatul Qadr. Inna anzannahu fi Laylatul Qadr. And also, Inna anzannahu fi Laylatul Mubaraka. Kunna mundinin fiha yufraqu kullu amlin hakim. Amran min andina, inna kunna mursaleen. We are revealed in the blessed night, and we are of the warners to mankind sending down the night in the night of power every matter of importance of the year. So this is the yearly kitabah. And finally, there is the, the daily kitabah, and a taqdeer al yomi And this is where Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, يَسْأَلُهُ uh, مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي الشَّأْنِ That everyone in the, heaven, <coughs> in the earth asks Allah Azza wa Jal, and every day He's engaged in something new. So every day something else is written new. So these are the five main uh, points that are related to the kitabah. Ketab uh, al-Azari and then al-Umari, the, the, the lifetime. You got that one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the third ca- category of Qadr. So we talked about the first one is al an the knowledge. And the second one we said is al-Kitabah, the writing. And the third one is uh, al-Mashiya, the, the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Or irada, some people say, the desire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ If Allah wants something, He simply says, be and it is. وَلَوْ شِئْنَ لَا تَيْنَا كُلَّ نَفْسٍ هُدَاهَا وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي لَأَمْلَ أَنَّ جَهَنَّمْ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ يَجْمَعِينَ If we wanted, we would have given every soul its guidance. However, the statement has been established and that I will fill the hellfire from jinn and humans. So in this point, وَلَوْ شِئْنَا If we had wanted, this is the Mashiach. Of Allah Azawajal, He wants whatever He wants will be. قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك من تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير. O King of the Kingdoms, you give kingdoms to whom you will, and you take them away from whom you will, and you honor who you will, and you disgrace who you will. In your hands is all good, and you are over everything powerful. So the point of this. Allah subhanahu wa gives the kingdom to who He wills, Mashiach. And on the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لَا يَقُولُنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ اللَّهُمَّ غَفِرْ لِي إِنْ شِتْ اللَّهُمَّ رَحَمْنِي إِنْ شِتْ لِيَعَزِمْ الْمَسْأَلَةِ فَإِنَّهُ لَا مَكْرَهْ لَهُ Like you should never say in your dua, Oh Allah, forgive me if you will. Oh Allah, have mercy upon me if you will. But you should be uh, firm in your dua and your, in your questioning of Allah and your asking of Allah Azza wa Jal because no one can force him to will anything. He wills as he pleases. So that's the, the third component of Qadr. And the fourth one is the creation. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created everything. As the Prophet said, Inna Allah khaliqa kulli saniyan wa saniyatuhu. Rated by Al Hakim, and it was authenticated by Imam Al Dhahabi and others that the Prophet said, Allah created everything, every maker, and that which it makes. So basically, anything in existence, Allah Azza wa Jal, He has created. And anything that goes forth from that creation is also from part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amaloon. In Surah Safat, Allah has created you and what you will do. And in Surah Al-Falaq, قُلْ عَوْذِ رَبِّ الْفَلَقْ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ I seek refuge in the Lord of the daybreak from the evil He has created. created so these are the main components of Qadr, the four main components, right? In the history of Islam, there was two major groups that kind of went astray in this, in this chapter, in Qadr. They're called al Jabariya and al Qadariya. So al Jabariya, they said that that Subhanallah, like Allah Azza wa Jal, He has written everything, and man has no choice in the affair. So basically, like every single human being is just like a robot, like He has no will whatsoever. And that's dhulm because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala 
want to put a person in the hellfire if he didn't give him a choice. The other extreme is called al qadriya And they said that uh, the people or humans and jinn, they have a complete choice and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not will anything. Like Allah doesn't know what's going to happen until someone or something does it. So those are the two extremes of Qadr and they both they went astray. right? Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'a, the people that follow the, the authentic belief of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they say that it's kind of in the middle path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has decreed everything and in His decree, He has given us the choice because He is all just. It won't be fair for Him to like force you to do something. Right? So we have the choice in Qadr. Um, a human example, just to like get an idea, and it's of obviously no comparison to Allah Azza wa Jal. لِلَّهِ الْمَثْلُ الْعَالَىٰ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There's nothing unlike to Allah Azza wa Jal. Basically, uh, for example, say a teacher right, has some students, a classroom. And that teacher gives everybody the same curriculum, gives everybody the same books, teaches everybody the same amount of time. However, so in that class, there's going to be some students that fail and some students that pass. You can't say the teacher did dhulm to those students because she knows in her, in her mind already who's going to fail and who's going to pass just by their actions and by their study habits and by their, their beings. And this is like a very simple human example. So imagine Allah Azza wa Jal, who is all knowledgeable. He knows everything that's going to happen. Right? He knows what the slave is going to do. But He given us, gives us the chance. And at the end of the day, I always say the, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, عنه, or the saying of Ibn Abbas, عنه, he said, Al-Qadru sirrullahi fil ard. That the decree, or the divine decree, Al-Qadr, is Allah's secret upon the earth. Like some things we cannot delve deep into because it's beyond our, con- our, 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 our minds. Like you cannot compare the creation to the creator. Right? Like simple things we, we, don't, we can't put our grasp, you know, we can't put our minds around, you know, let alone trying to comprehend the creation of Allah Azza wa in its completeness or the qadr of Allah Azza wa So this state by Ibn Abbas, عنه, I found very beneficial in the sense of having the gist of what Allah Azza wa said in the Quran, understanding the basics like we went through, what's required of us in qadr, but not delving too deeply because we can never fully understand. It's as Ibn Abbas said, Sirullahi fil ard. It's Allah's secret on this earth. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, talking about Qadr, I'd rather grasp a burning coal burning in my hand until it cools off than to say something about Allah's decreed, uh, I wish it didn't happen. Showing his iman in, in Allah Azza wa Jal and how he loves the, he's content with the Qadr of Allah. Right? So anything that happens, he would never say, I wish this didn't happen because it happened by Allah's decree. Right? So the more iman you have, the more you accept this decree. And you don't try to like argue against it or, or have bad thoughts about it. And now we'll go start the, uh, the book, inshallah. So the Imam continues. Ad dua wal qadr. The supplication and the divine decree. Wa huna su'al mashhur wa huwa anna al madu bihi in kana qad qudir lima lam yakun bud min wakuihi. دَعَى بِهِ الْعَبْدُ أَوْ لَمْ يَدْعُهُ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ قَدْ قُدِّرَ لَمْ يَقَعَ سَوَاءً سَأَلَهُ الْعَبْدُ أَوْ لَمْ يَسْأَلْهُ that, So the famous question that arises in this chapter is that if what is going to happen has already been written, if the person calls upon Allah or he doesn't call upon Allah, why should we call upon Allah? Why should we make dua? If it's already written, you know, what's the purpose of it? فَظَنَّ الطَّائِفَةٌ صَحَتْ هَذَا السُؤَالِ فتركت الدعاء وقالت لا فائدة فيه وهؤلاء مع فرط جهلهم وضلالهم متناقضون فإن طرد مذهبهم يوجب تعطيل جميع الأسباب فيقال لأحدهم So now he's saying so one group of people they accepted this premises or this premise and saying that there's no purpose in making dua like why should we make dua if, if everything is already uh, مخدور قدر right and this is like the, the, the other group of Jabriya that we talked about earlier that went astray, saying that you know, everything is forced upon us. There's no choice in the matter. So this is kind of like that group. So they're saying, what's the purpose? So the Imam, he's going to respond to them. He says, إِنْ كَانَ الشَّبْعُ 
قد قدر لك فلا بد من وقوعهما أكلت أم لم تأكل وإن لم يقدر لم يقع أكلت أو لم تأكل So he said that responding to these people answering this, this type of doubtful uh, matter he's saying so um, eating and drinking or you being uh, satiated you know, with, with food or with drink has been written right so even if you eat or you don't eat it's been written so why should you bother eating or drinking using that same logic Right? And then he goes on to another example saying that if you have a child, or you're, it's written for you to have a child, uh, it, it's written regardless. So why bother getting married and, and having relations with your wife? Right? If you use that same logic. So the Imam is refuting, him, refuting these people saying basically, you have to take with asbab, you have to take with reason and use logic. Yes, it's written, but also Allah subhanahu wa gave us the choice to do actions. Right? It's written that we're going to get our provision, but we have to put the food in our mouth in order for that provision to give us sustenance by Allah's permission. So this is how he responded to the first group. The other group, he said, um, is a little bit better in a sense that they said that the dua is, not, is only for worship only, and there's no real reasoning behind it. So it's not, it doesn't matter if we get something or we don't get something, we just make dua for ibadah. This is also wrong because Allah is he doesn't do anything without purpose and he doesn't ask you to call upon him. He said, ujibu da'wa. Like I will answer your call. So that means there is a purpose between it. Besides worship, there's also a purpose in asking Allah Azza so he can give us what we're asking for. And then he goes on in detail about these two groups, but that's the, the, the summary of it, the gist of it. And he goes and talks about the correct group. That there's a third group besides the two groups that we just talked about. That this thing that was written has been written with reasonings, reasons behind it. And from the reasons for that thing being answered is the dua itself, making supplication. So it was not written for you without its sabab, without its reason. Like the thing that's going to come to you was written that you're going to make dua for that thing. Right? Those things are written together. So therefore, it's necessary when you, make, uh, when you want something, you have to make the dua with it as well. And likewise, if you um, make dua, you expect Allah Azza is going to answer your dua. As He has promised us in the Quran. And we went through before. We said one way or the other, Allah is going to answer the dua. And He said, just like we said about the eating and drinking, as it's written for you to be full or... or to satisfy your hunger or satisfy your thirst, it's also written for you to take the food and the drink. You know, so no one can say that I want to have uh, be full and not not eat anything and expect to be full. And likewise, example of the child, you can't say I want to have children and not get married and, and have relations with your wife and expect the child. So every action has a uh, reasoning behind it to do as well. وَكَذَلِكَ قُدِّرَ دُخُولِ الْجَنَّةِ بِالْعَمَالِ وَدُخُولِ النَّارِ بِالْعَمَالِ وَهَذَا قِسْمٌ هُوَ الْحَقِّ and likewise, it has been written that people will enter into paradise for the actions they have done and they will enter into the hellfire for the actions they have done and this is the correct category and the correct opinion. الدعاء من أقوى الأسباب And the dua is one of the best of reasonings or ways to get uh, what you are asking for. وحين إذن فالدعاء من أقوى الأسباب فإذا قدر وقوع المدعو به بالدعاء لم يصح أن يقال لا فائدة في الدعاء كما لا يقال لا فائدة في الأكل والشرب وجميع الحركات والأعمال وليس شيء من الأسباب أنفع من الدعاء ولا أبلغ في الحصول المطلوب. So basically saying there's nothing more beneficial in reaching what you desire than the dua. And as we said, just like you want to satisfy your hunger, you need to eat, or your thirst, you need to drink. When you want to ask Allah Azza to get what you really want, make dua to Him. And this is the most uh, powerful of reasons to attain your goals and desires. Like we said before, sometimes we think of all the other means to get what we want before consulting with Allah Azza wa Jal. Whereas it should be the other way around. You should consult and go to Allah Azza wa Jal first and make dua to Him first and then take everything else that you need to get to those, to those things. Always put Allah first. Like we said in the ayat, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ أَنْ يَقُولُ لَوْ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ all he has to say is be and it is. You know. You can have that time, you made this dua in a certain time and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was listening to you and he accepted it, right? It could have been like 
you were in a certain need and Allah knew of you that need and it was written for you to make dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he accepts it. So always go to dua and to Allah Azawajal first and foremost. It's reported that Umar radiallahu anhu used to always seek victory with dua. وَلَمَّا كَانَ صَحَابَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ أَعْنَمَ الْأُمَّةِ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وأفقههم في الدين كانوا أقوم بهذا السبب وشروطه وآدابه من غيرهم And as is known that the, the companions of the Prophet, may Allah be pleased with them, they were the most knowledgeable of the Ummah of Allah Azza wa Jal and the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. They knew the best, they knew Allah the best, they knew the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم the best and they were the most, had the most understanding in the deen and they taught us the best reasoning to attain your uh, desire is to go through the du'a. So if they are the most knowledgeable of all the generations, we should follow their example. And they're telling us the best way to reach your matloob is to call Allah Azza wa Jal. وَكَانَ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ يَسْتَنْصُرْ بِهِ عَلَىٰ عَدُوِّهِ وَكَانَ أَعْذَمُ جُنْدِهِ وَكَانَ يَقُولْ يَصْحَابِهِ لَسْتُمْ تَنْصُرُونَ بِكَثْرَ وَإِنَّمَا تَنْصُرُونَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَكَانَ يَقُولْ إِنِّي لَا أَحْمِلْ هَمَّ الْإِجَابَةِ وَلَكِنْ هَمَّ الدُّعَاءِ فَإِذَا أَلْهَمْتُمْ دُعَاءَ فَإِنَّ الْإِجَابَةِ مَعَهُمْ So the Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, he used to seek a victory with dua always. And he said that that was one of his greatest armies. That was his greatest armies, the dua. And he used to tell his companions, you don't attain your victory by the numbers you have, but you attain your victory from the sama, from Allah azza wa jal. And he said, I don't uh, really care too much about the answering of the dua as I care about making the dua. Because that's the most important thing. Look how the ummah in the past with their dua, how, how, how great and how successful they were. right? Because they had that connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. They had tawakkal ala Allah. They depended on Allah. They had that firm belief in qada and qadr. And they knew that the affairs of the world are in Allah's hands. They sought honor in the deen. And Allah gave them honor. However, once they left that and they started seeking honor through other means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He disgraced them. And it's so sad today that we have one point, whatever billion, you know, almost two billion, you know, over one-fifth of the earth's population. We have the greatest amount of resources in the world. And look at, what, look at the state that we're in. How shameful is that? Because we left the dua. We left turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. We tried all the other, other ways, all the other means, disgracing ourselves, seeking pleasure from others that who, besides Allah azza wa jal, selling out. And we forget to turn to Allah azza wa jal. So inshallah we should try our best to purify our hearts and call to Allah first and foremost. Maybe that dua of one person will get answered and he can change the affairs of this ummah. You know, these are all times of tribulation and test and seeing if we're going to be calling back to Allah, calling to Allah Azza wa Jal, or we're going to be neglectful. You know, especially us here where we live and all the na'mah and, and blessings we have. You know, we, we can easily be forgetful and not remember all the hardships that the rest of the world is going through and not be thankful to Allah for all the blessings we have or not be remindful of our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering. You know. So alaykum bid dua. You know, I encourage you and myself, inshallah, to make this dua. You were mentioning earlier how um, you know, the, the, the state of our ummah is very shameful and it's, you know, we're in a state of weakness and how dua is something that's very powerful, um, something we definitely shouldn't neglect. Um, and one may observe that, you know, as Muslim, we, I guess a lot, a lot of people do make dua. And, you know, there's millions of people that travel to Mecca, um, make Umrah, make Hajj, raise their hands, crying to Allah, uh, making dua for the entire Ummah, for all 21 uh, in the Muslim countries. but we don't necessarily notice um, a change in our state. So is there some sort of a precondition that's missing? So Allah knows best. Um, the brother's asking about, uh, you know, why we're in the state that we're in, even though people are making dua. 
and it could be you know one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us to see if we will keep continue to make dua and he's saving to answer the dua you know maybe inshallah in this world definitely we know there will come a time where the Muslims will come back or if we don't see that or witness that in the akhirah also it could be the state of the person or the people you know like we said in the hadith before the person yutilu safar ash'atha aghbar yamuddu yadayhi ila samaa ya rab ya rab wa mat'amu haram wa mashrabu haram wa ghudhiya bil haram fa anna istijaba lahu wa malbasu haram wa ghudhiya bil haram fa anna istijaba lahu that the person he's traveling we said that was one of the means for your dua to be accepted he was disheveled and humbled and we said that's another means of your dua to be accepted he raises his hands to the seven, to the heavens we said that's another means for your dua to be accepted so all these means of dua being accepted but he is eating from haram drinking from haram wearing haram nourishing from haram so how is Allah going to answer his dua you know people subhanallah they, they go to Mecca and Medina or the Kaaba and they raise their hands crying Ya Allah Ya Allah and as soon as Hajj is over they go back to having their job in, in riba eating riba you know or having ghish, cheating people, or lying, or backbiting, right? So there's a nifaq sometimes also, like there's a, there's a hypocrisy, and that could be a reason as well. But for the mukhlisin, the ones who are sincere, and the salihin, the ones that are pious, and they're making dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to that dua, and it will be answered, inshaAllah. So we shouldn't give up, and we should always keep making the dua, and we should try our best to stay away from the haram, and make islah for the ummah. Like you have a duty upon yourself and your family and your loved ones and your close ones to make islah. The more we make islah, the more we correct the affairs of ourselves and our families, the better chances for our dua to be accepted and the better chances for the state of the ummah to be bettered. Right? We've been beat up and down for a long time now. So it's time to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, check yourself first and foremost. What am I doing wrong? How can I get closer to Allah? It starts with the individual. You know? Then those that are close to you, your loved ones, your family, how can you help them get closer to Allah? Your friends, your neighbors, your society. We have a duty, especially living in this society, to call others to Islam. Allah knows best. Can you change your qadr? Um, Yes, if it was maqdur. So if it's decreed to change your qadr. So, for example, like we said previously, you, uh, a harm was going to come to befall you, and it was written that you're going to make dua, and you made dua, so that harm didn't befall you. Or if the harm came, it would be less harmful because you made that dua. So in that sense, like the, the companions said that, you cannot change qadr except with qadr. So part of the qadr is taking the asbab, like we said. You know, like the deviant groups were saying that, you know, there's no purpose in making dua. And Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he responded to them saying that there is purpose. You know, just like you said, you want to eat, uh, if you're hungry and, or thirsty, you don't say, I don't need any food or, or drink, I'm just going to become satiated without eating or drinking. No, you go and take the asbab. So you eat and you drink so you can become full or you can be satisfied. The same thing with dua. If you want something, you have to call, take the asbab, the reason, make dua to Allah so your, your, your question can be answered. And it's, that was another point we were making last week is that be continuous in your dua because you don't know how it's going to benefit you. You, know? like you can be saved from al bala an, an, an evil that's going to happen to you because of that dua you kept making. You know? So don't give up on the dua. MashaAllah, that's a good question. So, how can we. Like, is there, is there a contradiction between being content in a state that you're in and making dua? Is that a way? So, no, there's no, there's no um, contradiction because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has written for you this current state and He's the one that can change that state. So you're not displeased with Allah's qadr, but you're asking Allah to change that state in His qadr as well, right? And you'll be pleased with it, whatever He gives you. 
So it's a difference between someone who is in a certain state and he's complaining about it and not being satisfied and, and, and you know, and a person that's um, content with the state he's in because he knows Allah subhanahu wa has written for him but wanting to have a better state. You know, either way he's going to be satisfied and content or she'll be satisfied and content. So there's no contradiction and it's encouraged to make dua in this state because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves to hear you to make dua and to um, ask for him to change the state. We always, you know, for example, if we fall into sin, we want to make tawbah and, and change our state to the better. You know, if we're in poverty, we want to be given wealth so that we can help others in a better fashion. Right? So it's always good to want to change your state and to get better and better no matter what. But you're content with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you. In the dunya sense, like the scholars say, always look at those who are less fortunate to you or than you. And in the deen, always look to those who are higher than you. Because you know? in deen, you always want to strive to get better. Like the Prophet ﷺ said that there's no jealousy except for two. The one who has memorized the Qur'an and acts upon it. And the one who has a lot of wealth and he spends in the uh, cause of Allah. So we can love to be like those two, two categories, right? In the deen. In the, the dunya, you'll always find, no matter how bad of a state you're in, you're going to find someone that's less, uh, less, less fortunate than yourself. Just turn on the news, you know, and, and, and look around the world. We live in luxury. Like, just the fact that we can go to any faucet and turn the water on and have a drink of water at any time we want is a luxury. You know, some people have to walk miles and miles just to get a sip of water. Some people don't even have that sip of water. You know, they're starving to death. A mother watches her child die in front of her because she doesn't have the breast milk to feed the child. People are living, they don't know if they're going to live the next day because bombs are being dropped upon them. Yeah. So we're living in a great state of luxury, and that's a test as well for us. Yeah. So don't be complacent in this. Always make dua. So this is what we talked about at the beginning of class, and that is that if you have iman and qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you know deeply that everything He has written is for a reason, like he doesn't do anything for, for no reason. And he is the most wise. He puts everything in its proper place. So your heart will be content. Like if Allah, if this happened, it was by Allah's permission, right? I may not know the wisdom behind it. I may suffer from it temporarily. However, I'm not going to argue against Allah's qadr, you know. Like the father of Yusuf, alayhi salam, when his son was taken from him, his heart hurt you know he had love for his son to the point that he you know lost his vision from crying so much but he said sabrun jameel wallahu musta'an you know he'll have a beautiful patience and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who helps so at the end of the day he was content with Allah's qadr and he had trust in Allah azza wa jal ummi musa you know asbaha fu'ad ummi musa fariha she had to put him in the ocean her brand new little baby throw him in the, the river, the Nile, huge river. And her heart became empty. Like she, she missed her baby so much. But she had tawakkal on Allah. She depended on Allah. She knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered something for a reason. So always when we do something or something happens to us, we have that in the back of our mind. Like Allah is in charge. This happens for a reason. You know, There's no news. Like the, the mu'min, the believer, the awliya of Allah, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. They don't have uh, fear for um, things that are going to come. And they don't have grief for that which is past. Because they have true iman. Everything that's past is by Allah's permission. We can't change it. Anything that's going to come is by Allah's permission. You know, The hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that لو اجتمعت الأم أن ينفعوك بشيئا لم ينفعوك بشيئا إلا ما كتب الله لك That if all the nations were to gather together to do you some type of good, or benefit, they won't be able to benefit you except with that, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written. And if they all gather to do you harm, they won't be able to do you harm except with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written. When you have that iman in your heart, like, in mashallah, you don't have any fear, you don't have any regrets, you know, you feel comfortable. You might get hit, you know, when something happens at that moment, but you should be quick to realize this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree and be patient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you peace of the heart. It also might be a reminder for some people. You know, if you're neglectful, 
if you're wandering, if you're deviating, Allah might give you something hard or harmful to remember, remind you to come back to Him. You know, oh, you go back into Tawbah, you go back into Sujood, you go back into Salah, you get closer to Allah because of that. You know? So this is how the believer should act. When someone's weak in faith or has no, no Iman, they suffer the worst. You know, that's why we just see, we keep seeing it over and over again, some of the richest, successful, most popular people committing suicide because they don't have that Iman and Qadr. They think that everything is without purpose. You know? That can be very depressing. If you don't have a higher purpose in your life, you don't know that things happen for a reason. People can feel hopeless to the point they will take their own lives. You know? But Muslim and Mu'min, the believer, he knows that everything happens for a purpose and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of the affairs. So be patient. You know? Even if it's the, the, the worst suffering in the world, on the Day of Judgment, it will feel like a day or part of a day. Your whole life, if you live a thousand years, is going to feel like a day or part of a day. Yawman o ba'da yawm. Right? And they said, Ashqa ahl al-ardi, like the most miserable person of the earth. But he was a believer. He'll be dipped into heaven, just one dip. And he'll be asked by the angels, did you taste any, good, uh, any, any harm, sh hardship in this life? And he'll say no. Just by that one dip in heaven, he forgets all the hardship he went through. The most miserable person in the dunya. But he was a mu'min. Right? And then on the other extreme, the most uh, one that had the easiest life, the most riches, the most popularity, everything you could wish, but he had no iman, no faith, he'll be dipped once into the hellfire and asked by the angels, did you have any good in this life? And he'll say no. He forgot all that good and all that wealth, all those pleasures that he had in this dunya, he forgot it. There's that one dip in the hellfire. So it's just prioritizing your, your, your thoughts and your, your beliefs and your creed and realizing how this world is temporary and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is who, He's the one who is in charge. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha ila ant astaghfirullah wa tubi ilaik. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.